2022 was a banner year for good movies. It was the year that gave us all hope that the dark ages of cinema may finally be over. There were some spectacular movies this year which aimed to entertain without spreading any message or degrading anyone, which is a welcome change. But which were the best movies of the year? In this video, I'll be going over my picks for best movies of the year. So strap in, dear viewer, it's going to be a fantastic ride. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you never miss out on all new reviews I put out weekly here at Off The Cover. And without further ado, on to the video. 2022 was the first year when theaters were fully open and people actually ventured back out to theaters. But as studios found out through box office receipts, they didn't venture out for just any movie. You see, people have grown tired of all the derivative drivel that's come out over the last decade that was the dark ages of cinema. People are tired of being preached to. The message just doesn't resonate with people and drives them away. Studios are finally starting to wake up to the fact that getting woke means going broke. So we finally started to get good movies with good stories and good character development. The sun is beginning to shine once more in Hollywood. In no particular order, here are my picks for best movies of this year. The Northman. Starting with The Northman, this is a graphic retelling of the Shakespearean classic Hamlet. The Northman is a movie that treats its viewer with respect and shows rather than explains the plot. This act of showing rather than telling is perhaps why audiences seem to enjoy the film so much and why it reviewed so well prior to release. Who knew that when you respect your fans, they actually appreciate it? While it doesn't have the intellectual introspection of the original play, it does give everyone involved a chance to show their talents. Robert Eggers, despite having only two indie credits to his name in The Witch and The Lighthouse, was a big risk that paid off in terms of direction and overall feel of the movie. In all three films, Eggers did a fantastic job in setting up the mood and environments. He also shined in getting the most out of his actors, although he was working with massive talent. The Northman was a worthwhile flick to catch. The direction captured the feel and grit of the Dark Ages in the varied environments of Northern Europe. It was very competently shot and was working off a very tightly written script. And as I've mentioned in my review for Violet Night, I do sincerely hope that we'll get more films about Norse mythology and the Dark Ages, as this is not a time period that's been well explored in film as of yet. The Batman. This was a movie I had no expectation of being good. After the Ben Affleck iteration, I didn't have high hopes. But I did like Robert Pattinson, who is a great actor, and like Daniel Radcliffe, trying to escape his childhood movies. This iteration of Batman most closely resembled the detective comics in which the character first appeared. It was a dark, gritty take on the character, which wasn't quite captured on film before. The Tim Burton version certainly had some grit and darkness, but it did have an element of campiness. The Batman was more rooted in reality, which is what made the Dark Knight trilogy, as well as even the original Iron Man movie, so compelling. With Warner Brothers getting a new makeover and a new head honcho, I wouldn't be surprised if Pattinson gets recast. But I would urge the talking heads in the studio to reconsider, because Pattinson played the character superbly well. His dark, brooding ways certainly played well into the tortured past of Bruce Wayne. Certainly, the director needs to be promoted after this showing because I had a lot of fun with this one. Bullet Train Bullet Train was one of the most stylish films this year. It provided a tight story with excellent character development. One of the things I liked most about this film was how well it was written. The story is layered in such a way that it seamlessly unravels. This intricate story examines how these individuals approach what they do and why. Each character has a fleshed out backstory and complete story arc. By the end of the movie, you knew what each character was about and how they fit into the narrative. Wow, a well-written script and narrative? Who knew that was possible these days? 
but director David Leitch had done it again. His previous directing credits include Deadpool 2 and Atomic Blonde, both of which have a unique style and feel which Leitch brings into Bullet Train and turns it up to 11. The cinematography and visual style of the movie feel quite fresh and fun, slightly flashy but not overly so. He found the right balance between serious action and slapstick comedy, which is a tough thing to do usually, which just highlights his skill level as a filmmaker. The action sequences slowly built up in intensity until a spectacular grand finale that was visually very impressive. It's a non-stop thrill ride of layered characters, plot twists, and edge-of-your-seat excitement. How the characters interacted and played off each other was charming and enjoyable, providing much-needed levity to tense situations. It was competently shot with a fresh visual style that would invite a second rewatch easily. I also enjoyed that the film didn't dabble in politics or have any sort of agenda other than to entertain the audience. I love this film. Everything, everywhere, all at once. What makes this film so creative is how well the story weaves together different possibilities for its characters. The set pieces, however simple they may be, truly show off different aspects of the multiverse. Evelyn's alternate versions of a chef, a famous actress, and even a rock on a planet devoid of life showed off the writer's imagination. You truly don't know what you've lost until it's gone, and I'm glad we got imagination back with this film. It's truly been a long time since I've seen a movie that's so creative and inventive. The script pulls everything together in an emotionally smart, engaging, and satisfying story. I came out of the theater uplifted and happy. I had fun. And that's what's been missing in Hollywood for so long. The writers and filmmakers have forgotten the central purpose of filmmaking, for the audiences to have fun. Films are windows to other worlds, other possibilities and opportunities. That's what made this film so excellent. It carefully and meticulously crafted that window and showed everything, everywhere, all at once. 3,000 Years of Longing 3,000 Years of Longing is not a predictable film. It doesn't fall to common tropes or cliches. Instead, it provides the viewer with a nuanced take on a classic tale. It analyzes what made folk tales such as Alibaba and the Forty Thieves and Aladdin so good. By showing the Jin's life story, it provided something newer and more innovative. It's an excellent example of rejuvenating old stories for modern audiences. The Northman also did this by showing the story of Hamlet in a more gruesome and grounded way and made it more believable and relatable. Remaking or retelling stories doesn't have to ruin the original much as what Disney has been doing with its classic movies as of late. Throughout the film, the modern world creeps in, suffocating, sterile, noisy, and most of all, skeptical. In a brilliant metaphor, when the djinn arrives in London, he is suffocated by all the sights and noises both seen and unseen. All the electromagnetic signals overwhelm him. In the modern world, few people believe in folk tales such as this because they're more skeptical. It is possible, as Alethea continues to doubt the djinn's increasingly personal stories, the filmmakers suggest that we may no longer be as sensitive to the story's power, which leaves us that much farther from understanding one another. Maybe we think we're too good for fables or morality tales, or maybe we've become so self-involved that we naturally think every story hinges on whether we personally believe it. We've lost imagination we had as children, and this film brings it back with full force. When the credits rolled, I thought to myself, wow, what a creative film. It's such a shame that there are so few of these films released nowadays. Don't worry, darling. It's been a while since we've gotten a well-written female character. Alice doesn't start out as the omniscient and infallible Mary Sue characters we've been getting for the past decade. She starts out as an innocent housewife who begins to suspect her husband isn't who he says he is. She slowly starts to piece things together through her curiosity and ingenuity, which allows her to grow as a character. 
We haven't gotten female characters written like this in quite some time, and it's a breath of fresh air to finally get what audiences have been clamoring for, which shows through the audience scores on Rotten Tomatoes for this film. Olivia Wilde is emerging as one of the most talented new directors in Hollywood today. Her direction of the movie was multi-layered and nuanced. The world building in Don't Worry Darling was done with a great level of care and detail. Each scene ratcheted up the tension for both the characters and the audience, intensifying the mystery without revealing everything at once. The audience grew along with the character of Alice as we all found out more of what was really going on. It actually reminded me a lot of the old Alfred Hitchcock films from the 50s and 60s. Olivia Wilde, like Hitchcock, increased the tension to engage the audience on a deeper level, making them more invested in the outcome. She also didn't throw in any woke agenda or political messaging, only focusing on character development and world building, which created a much richer experience and fantastic final payoff. Beavis and Butthead do the universe. The word genius is thrown around a lot with wanton abandon. Some people deserve it and some people definitely don't. If ever there was a man that deserved the title, it would be Mike Judge. At this point, he cemented his legendary status among film and television producers. He's brought us such classic gems as Office Space and Idiocracy, as well as television classics like Milton and King of the Hill. But for me, growing up in the 90s, it didn't get any better than Beavis and Butthead. This show was comedy gold. Its subtle and not-so-subtle social commentary were intelligently written and shown. The show even got a movie adaptation in 1996, so you can imagine my excitement that after so many years we would be getting a sequel in Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe. Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe is a fresh and creative take on modern culture. Its social commentary cuts at the heart of what is really going on in society and provides carefully crafted analysis and insight. On the surface, the movie and show may appear dumb and stupid, but deep down, it is wildly intelligent. People can definitely learn a thing or two from the show and the movie. Most importantly, they can be entertained, which is so sorely lacking these days. Top Gun Maverick. Wow, what an awesome movie. Top Gun Maverick was everything I thought it could be and much, much more. It's not often the case that a sequel can rival the first, but man, this movie may actually be better than the first in almost every way. I had seen the original when I was a little kid, so I went back and rewatched it. I appreciated it way more as an adult, especially the Tony Scott cinematography of filming most scenes at the golden hour. The sequel pays homage to the original in that regard, as well as many other ways without regurgitating the same story like some movies. Also, the fact that Tom Cruise came out before the film and thanked the fans for seeing the movie spoke volumes. Showing respect and deference to the fans counts, and when people see that, they tend to reward that, as we saw with the box office returns. It reminded me of when I flew to Colorado to go hiking and camping in August of 2020, and a stewardess came up to me, eyes tear-filled, thanking me personally for choosing to fly during that very difficult time. It made me appreciate her efforts more. Tom Cruise and that stewardess personalized the experience for me by showing respect and gratitude. Hollywood could really learn something here. Those are my picks for best movies of 2022. Each movie provided a good story, good character development, without some agenda or message. It felt so good not to be preached to and actually respected as a moviegoer and film lover. Here's hoping 2023 brings us more films without wokeness and agendas. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe for more great content.